there, and welcome to the Cory Doctorow podcast. And uh, here I am about to read to you a little more from Martian Chronicles, the story I've been working on for some time, or reading to you for several weeks. I'm actually almost finished reading it. I should be done in a day or two. It's a little longer than uh, my editor bargained for. I'm hoping that he can live with that. Otherwise, there may be some cutting ahead. Um, one note... I'm trying to figure out how to say this without sounding like a dick. But one small note. I realized today that I am at total occupancy. That between now and when I go away for Christmas on December 23rd, there's just no more time in my schedule. Not even a little bit of time in my schedule. No time for um, social gathering. No time to answer questions that are on your mind just because you are wondering. Um, certainly no time for any meetings, phone calls, interviews. I'm just, I'm just there. I'm at, I'm, I'm at capacity. I can do all the stuff I've committed to, but I can't do anything else. And I'm getting a, a really large number of requests for time between now and then. So just kind of forewarning, um, if you ask me after January 8th when I get back, I can't promise I'll say yes, but if you ask me before January 8th when I get back, I can promise you I'll say no. Uh, whatever the question is, the answer will be no if it involves any time, because I'm just out, just done. That's, uh, I really can get it all done, but I can't do any more. Um, now, apropos of Christmas, I do have some slightly less grumpy news. That, that really does sound grumpy. You know, I recorded that three times, and it came out grumpy every time. I'm sorry if that sounded grumpy. Uh, I feel terrible when I say no to people when they ask me to do stuff. I really want to say yes. Um, I've benefited so many times from people who've said yes to me and have given me of their time. And the last thing I want to do is kind of fail to pay that forward. But there comes a point when you've agreed to pay forward all that you can pay, and you're, you're kind of bankrupt at that point. Uh, I'm doing a ton of kind of favors and things for people between now and Christmas break. I just can't squeeze any more in. Anyway, enough of that. Um, some other better Christmas news. Uh, well, the Boing Boing Charity Guide went up last week. You probably saw it if you follow Boing Boing. If you didn't, you can Google Boing Boing Charitable Giving Guide 2009. Um, and uh, we picked some of our favorite charities for the year. Apropos of that, I asked people who had their own charities that they liked to mention them in the comments. And today or tomorrow, I'm going to go through the comments and pick out some of those best, some of the best descriptions from there. And I'm going to put up another post that's the Boing Boing Readers Charity Guide. So um, if you were kind enough to actually go and post something in the comments there, you may see it on the front door sometime soon. Another guide that we did recently is the Boing Boing Gift Guide, uh, Holiday Giving Guide, where we went through all of our our favorite things for the year and um, put them up in, in several categories, gadgets and comics and books and novels, nonfiction and so on. It was a really good list. I actually ended up doing a lot of my Christmas shopping from it. Um, don't tell my friends that they're about to get stuff from that list. Uh, but it was great. It actually worked really well. Um, and some of you emailed me after my last podcast when I mentioned that I was going to go and have my MRI interpreted uh, and see a physio and um, to wish me luck. And I had some pretty good luck. I went and saw a physio. He's a, a Feldenkrais guy. Um, he seems like a very, very nice guy at, at the Pure Sport Clinic in the city in London. Um, Mark Fraunfelder, my co-editor on Boing Boing, had had some really good results from Feldenkrais, which is a kind of physiotherapy based on uh, many things, but one of them is increasing your own sort of proprietic uh, prior perception, uh, your proprietic sense, uh, so that you learn how to move your body better. And I had an hour and a half with him last week where he gave me some simple exercises, and they really seem to be making a small but measurable difference. Uh, and he said, kind of, this is about loosening things up enough that we can do some bigger work when you come back. So I'm going to be seeing him twice this week, and I'll let you know next week how it goes. I'm feeling really, really uh, positive about it, though. It's, it's really the first time. I've had any kind of therapeutic intervention in my back since it got really bad where I uh, really felt like I was making some progress. So I'm very glad about that. Anyway, enough of that. Happy holidays. And uh, here's a little bit more of the Martian Chronicles. Or actually, it's just called Martian Chronicles. No article. Like talking heads. Or bare naked ladies. The Eagle had only been finished two weeks before we boarded, the last carpets laid, the last bunks prepared, the last safety checks completed. But it still smelled like people had been sweating freely in its corridors for Janice. Smelled like a cross between the locker room and the garbage-filled green canal outside of the wall of Spruce Sunset Meadows on a hot day. 
The smell, it deserved the capital S, traveled like a sneaky fart into the eagle's nest in small gusts as the colonists passed out in groups of ten through the far airlock, just as they had entered by the opposite lock. Every time the lock cycled, a little bit more of that toxic air puffed out until the room was choking on putrescence. Dad broke off from the intense conversation he'd been having with his buddies and gestured impatiently for me to join him and led me to the lock. He had a look on his face of steadfast refusal to face reality. He was not going to admit that the spaceship we were about to take up residence in had a smell. We were going to Mars, and it was going to be so freaking awesome that it was impossible to even take notice of any imperfection, not even a smell with its own capital letter. No whining! Mom took my hand and helped me down onto the same local vertical as them, and we Velcro shuffled our way to the lock, rip, 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 a family hand in hand with our space bags slung over our shoulders, about to become pioneers, about to leave behind Earth and all its authorities and laws and rules and governments. We were going to a place where we could be free, with a capital F, and if free had a smell, so be it. The airlock closed behind us. The equalization hiss was the only sound in the lock. There were ten of us, and I noticed that Vijay was part of our gang, and managed to nod at him, and he nodded back. Now that the lock was sealed, we were officially, irrevocably, gone. When the International Space Agency completed its certification tour of the Eagle, they completed their duty to the citizens of Earth's nations, and now they had no more authority over us. No one on Earth did. We were in space, and we were a new human race, free as almost no human being had ever been. No one had any claim over us, or our work, or our freedom, except for our peers, the people we'd elected to go to an alien world with. We were off to start anew. And we couldn't arrive a moment too soon. Spaceships suck. You probably didn't realize that, but they do. Spaceships are small, cramped, smelly, and overcrowded. Our cabin, the room that Mom, Dad, and me would spend the next six months in, was smaller than the mud room at home, where we took our boots and coats off before going into the house. All the furniture was folded away into the walls, and there was no toilet or shower. We had to share the communal toilets at the end of the hallway. Supposedly, there was one toilet for every six people, which someone had calculated was optimal. At home, we had four toilets for three people, not counting the one in the basement. And anyway, Helene did a count once we were underway and calculated that there was only one toilet for every twelve people, not that any of the grown-ups would listen to her. The toilets had a double smell. The putrid human smell got worse, not better, as time went by, though my nose was bravely refusing to get used to it, sacrificing itself by insisting on staying totally revolted by it so that I would know that I should get out ASAP. And the lesser smell of the air freshener that squirted constantly out of the little misters around the giant vacuum cleaner head that we stuck our butts into. That was like the smell of bubble gum, times one million, and it clung to your clothes after you used the head so that you smelled it for hours. Yes, we were pioneers. Pioneers had never been very comfortable. They drove covered wagons across America, my dad said. That's 10 a.m. And here's knapsack on my back. My knapsack on my back. They were killed by bandits, by Indians, by disease. They starved, they baked, they froze, they drowned. Dad's grandparents had come to America from Spain and Holland. They were middle-class architects who met at university and married and moved to San Diego because they wanted to live by the Pacific Ocean, and they did for most of their lives, retiring to Arizona just before most of San Diego ended up underwater. The closest any one of my ancestry had come to a covered wagon was a business-class seat on a British Airways 777 to LAX. Yup, I said, they sure did. Nevertheless, Dad, you have to admit that this ship is kind of crappy. None of the carpets are laid straight. Half the doors don't close right. Your bed falls off the wall every time you fold it out. He grinned a little. Yeah, okay. It's not exactly the Queen Mary, but it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to get us from Earth to Mars in one piece. If you don't like the room, there's always the lounge. Junior colonists, yes, seriously, junior colonists, had their own lounges, three of them, one on each deck. These were comparatively large spaces in the center of the ship, where there was almost no gravity. The Eagle was a big spinning donut, with lots of centripetal force, which feels a lot like gravity, around the edges, but almost none in the middle. The floaty parts in the middle were mostly shunned by grown-ups, who found them a little ulpy-gulpy, and were prone to losing their lunches in the middle of our play areas. That was fun by us. 
The JC lounges were pretty big to start with, but the absence of gravity made them even bigger, because it meant that we could use the ceilings, walls, and the middle as our functional space. And we did. At any time of the day or night, the ship had a 24-hour Martian clock that the colonists stuck to. You'd find them full of kids, most of us in our teens. The little ones had a supervised play area that the parents took turns overseeing. We'd be flying around the space with fins on our hands and long bungee cords around our waists, or we'd be tethered to something with our faces masked by goggles and our hands running up and down virtual keyboards suspended in midair. I never gamed with goggles and virtual keyboards at home, but then I never had to. My Martian Chronicles competition had all been physically separated from me, but now they were literally on every side of me, and if I'd used even a small screen, dozens of people would have been able to shoulder surf me. "'Good morning, boss,' Helene said, her voice so clear through my headset that she might have been right beside me. Then she tapped me on the shoulder, and I shoved my goggles up on my forehead and realized that she was right beside me, floating in space sideways to me, lazily sculling the air with her hand fins to keep herself from drifting away on the air currents. I suppressed a scowl. "'Good morning, Helene. Why have we abandoned operational security on this fine day?' Helene was supposedly going straight. She had vowed that she would give up raiding forever once we made Mars fall and go into legit business. This had cheered VJ and I no end, and, at VJ's insistence, I had given her some minor status in Oglethorpe Corp so that she could get some experience working for a living instead of destroying things. But she was a total loose cannon. She knew that we only talk business through the game to avoid being overheard. The game had good crypto protecting our conversations, something that was totally lacking in the cheek-by-jowl-by-butt-by-knee atmosphere of the JC lounges. But she actually wanted to talk, face to face. You're supposed to have been this big deal raider, I said. How did you survive? You got the secrecy instincts of an elephant. She shrugged, which caused her to start spinning in slow circles, which she seemed to enjoy. She shaved her head after the first day in space and kept it clean to the scalp, something that a lot of other kids had done since. I suppose I managed to keep it on the down low when it mattered and ignored it when it didn't. This is exactly the kind of thing that's going to get you into trouble when you go to work for some corp Mars side, I said, aware that I was lecturing, but unable to stop myself. Companies need to have policies. Employees need to obey these policies. It's fine to have ideas of your own, to try to get them circulated within the company and adopted, but you can't just go rogue whenever an idea comes into your shiny bald head. She rubbed her gleaming noggin. She must shave it every day to keep it so shiny. You seriously get off on this? Seriously? Role-playing that you're some big shot in a suit, telling other people what to do and amassing a fortune? She'd hinted many times that she thought that straight Martian Chronicles players were suckers and drones, but this was the first time she'd come out and said it to my face. She had that same lazy smile and didn't seem to be intending offense, but it got my back up. I swallowed a couple times. I get off on making things. I pay a good salary to people to help me create amazing things that succeed, that make money, and that make people happy. Making things together requires that you give up some of your individual freedom in order to help the company succeed. If you don't want to do that, you shouldn't take a job. Okay, she said. I won't take the job. Thanks for the memories. She gave no impression of being upset. She never showed much emotion beyond a kind of light-hearted, detached amusement. I was so shocked that I just watched her grab hold of her bungee, use it to pull herself to the bulkhead, where she could get her legs coiled underneath herself and then push off and go sailing away through the lounge, dodging and weaving between the players with their goggles and the other flyers, who were generally a lot less reckless than she was. VJ plucked his way along the wall to me, taking dainty, quick, velcroized steps that seemed ridiculous but actually got him around the space with a lot of speed and control. What was that, he said, drawing level with me and stopping his motion with a single finger pressed lightly against my shoulder. I became aware that I was snorting hot air from my nose like a cartoon bull with a head cold. I made myself stop. She quit, I said, because I asked her to adhere to court policy. I shrugged my shoulders. I guess there's no helping some people. She must have been born to be a raider. VJ pressed his lips together and managed to look both disapproving and non-judgmental at the same time. I don't know how he did it, but he did. After a week on the Eagle, VJ seemed to have worked out where all the angles were. He was bunking in a hardship case dorm with 30 other POVs, but he knew which dining room served the biggest portions, which gangways were fastest, which viewing ports were most likely to be free. No one apart from Helene and I talked to him. We might have been the only ones who saw him. People's eyes just slid over the POVs like they were invisible. VJ never gave any sign that he minded. 
He used his invisibility to get into places where we couldn't go, and he always had a fun adventure, what he called a good wheeze, up his sleeve. Well, I suppose she'll have to figure it all out when we get to Mars anyway, he said, as will we all. What does that mean? I know how to build a corp. I've done it before. I'll do it again. But you'll be a different kind of person on Mars than you were on Earth. You'll be an immigrant, a newcomer. You won't have any assets. You will be a pov, if you'll forgive the expression. I had never called him a pov. I was raised better than that. But we both knew that he was a pov, and I wasn't. Don't be ridiculous, I said. I can't be a pov. Why not? If you don't have money, you are poor. You have poverty. You are a pov. What a stupid day this was turning out to be. First Helene's temper tantrum, and now Vijay trying to needle me. In the first place, no one is an immigrant on Mars. An immigrant is someone who comes to your place, your country, or your planet to live. But Mars is our country. Mars Inc. and its stakeholders, that's us, own it. In the second place, a POV isn't someone who's poor. A POV is someone who refuses to stop being poor. They want handouts, not work. Their governments have told them that they have the right to food and shelter, so they want what's theirs by right. Now, I had heard and said these words hundreds of times. They were part of every civics class I'd ever taken. They were repeated several times a day through the Mars Inc. orientation. But I have to say, I never really thought about what it would be like to hear those words if you were a POV. Not until they came out of my mouth on that day. I felt the blush burning in my cheeks. I mean, Vijay, not you, obviously. Obviously, you want to work. You want to get out. And you did, see? You're smart and motivated. That's how you became an auditor. It's how you got to get on the eagle. He cocked his head. Brian, he said, you never asked me where my parents were. I swallowed. No, I said, I mean, I figured that you had to be an orphan. Oh, yes, I am an orphan. That's because when I was ten, a Procter & Gamble nutraceutical plant near my village leaked 70,000 tons of toxic fumes into the air. It killed over 95% of the people for 200 kilometers around. Many of them worked at the plant, or providing services to the people who did. The company argued that the division that owned the factory was totally separate from Procter & Gamble, even though P&G was the majority shareholder in it, and its only customer was P&G. Because of this, the Bangladeshi court was only able to render judgment on this separate company, which was practically bankrupt at this point. Luckily, there weren't many of us alive. The ones that lived got enough money to go to a good school and not to one of the bad orphanages, where the survival rate is about the same as living in the toxic plume of a P&G plant. I tried not to show how much this shocked me. It practically skewered me. It was so much goddamn reality. It made everything I knew seem so fake, pointless, like I'd been complaining about a splinter in my toe and this guy had had both of his feet eaten off by a tiger. So first I felt surprised, then embarrassed, then angry, though I didn't know at who or what. Maybe my parents for keeping me from reality, though hell knew I wouldn't want to live through what VJ had been through. Brian, he said, please calm down. Made me wonder what my face had been doing. I hadn't said anything. I just wanted you to see that people aren't just poor because they're lazy. Some people work as hard as mules every day of the week and die poor. Unbidden, the thought rose to my mind. They must be stupid then. It's not enough to work hard. You have to work hard doing something valuable. Some people work hard as mules and get hit by a bus or a chemical leak. Some people sit around on their fat asses all day and get rich. I saw that some heads turned when he said this. Statement like that one were about the worst thing you could say to a Mars colonist. I knew what I was supposed to say here. It was drilled into me. I said it. If someone figures out how to do more with less, that tells us that he's doing something right, and he should be rewarded for figuring stuff like that out. We don't want people to just work harder. We want them to work better. He nodded. Of course, Brian. That's what we're told. But Helene is a raider, and she's figured out a way to get a lot of money without working hard at all, by ruining the hard and valuable work of others. Where does she fit in? I swallowed. I suppose that's why it's not illegal, but I fumbled for the argument. Lots of people were listening. I felt like I was divulging corporate secrets to my competition, even though nothing we were saying had to do with my business. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's good. No, Vijay said, but you just said that anyone who figures out how to make more money with less work should be rewarded. I wanted to sink through the floor. I felt like everyone who was listening in could see that I was really just a loser, one of those people who didn't really understand everything that Mars Colony stood for, not in my heart. 
I should have had some decent arguments right there on the tip of my tongue, but all I had was a shamed, furious blushing. "'Listen, Pav,' said a voice from below me, loud enough to be heard around the room. "'You're a guest here. No one wants to hear your opinion on what successful people deserve or don't deserve. Why don't you go hang out with your own kind?' It was Liam, the red-headed mouthy kid. He ran an investment bank in Martian Chronicles, moving giant chunks of money around on behalf of big corps and big players. He was always too friendly with me, and too loud, and he also managed to make me feel like I had to go along with him or he might punch me in the gut. Not that I'd ever seen him be violent. He was just, you know, intense. VJ nodded his head, not ducking it, but nodding, as if Liam was confirming something he'd suspected all along, which somehow made Liam seem even more of a jackass. As you say, he said, and took off into the middle of the room, using a hard shove to get himself moving and steering himself expertly through the crowd. Liam swiped at his ankle as he passed, but he missed. Liam righted himself relative to me so that we were face to face. You need a better class of friend, Oglethorpe. Judge a man by the company he keeps. You're going to have to get yourself set up again, Mars side, and the impression you make on the ship will follow you around for the rest of your life. Just some friendly advice, you know, from your banker. You're not my banker, I didn't say, but I also didn't say, you're not my friend. And also not, the impression that'll follow you around for the rest of your life is going to be of a big mouth jerk. All right then, talk to you next week. You've been listening to the Cory Doctor Podcast, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, US 3.0. Or as Woody Guthrie put it in another context, this song is copyrighted in the US under seal of copyright 154085 for a period of 28 years, and anyone caught singing it without our permission will be a mighty good friend of ours, because we don't give a dern. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing to it, yodel it, we wrote it, that's all we wanted to do. Many thanks to John Taylor Williams for mastering. That's Rynek Studio, W-R-Y-N-E-C-K Studio at gmail.com. John Taylor Williams is a full-time self-employed audio engineer, producer, composer, and sound designer. In his free time, he makes beer, jewelry, odd musical instruments, and furniture. He likes to meditate, to read, and to cook. Talk to you next week. <laughs>